Good morning everyone and uh, for those of you who have been here before, a big welcome back to one of our webinars for anyone that's new. Hello, where have you been? Um, <laughs> a big uh, welcome to all and welcome to what I would class one of our quirkier webinars, Evolution of Damp Control, um, being hosted by our very own James Berry. Hello James. Morning, why is this quirky? Why is it quirky? Well, it is a wee bit more quirky compared to our other ones. Well, okay, was, was I using the wrong term there, quirky? I think it's quirky. I, I, think, the way you, I think the way you did it the last time was quite quirky. Well, anyway, guys, um, for those of you that have um, not been here before, um, let me just kind of give you some just housekeeping some stuff. The, if you want to kind of chat to us, say hello to us, engage with us, if you're on a laptop or a desktop, you should have a chat facility either there or there. Just simply just feel free just to jump into the comment bit and say a big hello, good morning to us. That's there for you to pose any kind of questions, etc. during the webinar. If you are using a mobile device, then if you just scroll down a little bit, you'll notice if you just pull it up, you'll see that there's a little comments bit. You can feel free just to pop in there and uh, say how we hello, tell us what you're up to. If you've got a big, lovely cup of coffee like I am. Um, there's also other things that you can do to try and say hello, pose questions and etc. cetera to us just while we're waiting to start. You can either email James or myself directly, just at Andy at Don't email me. What was that, James? Don't email me. I won't see him. Email you if you've got oh, it. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, just email me, folks. Just email me at andy at property-care.org. Or alternatively, um, jump onto one of our social media channels, either through Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook. All you simply need to do is when you go to these particular channels, just hit the search box and type in Property Care Association. We should pop up. Um, if we don't, I'd be quite surprised, but hopefully we do pop up okay. And feel free to say hello again if you've got any kind of questions during the webinar, either use the chat facility or use that facility in itself. So James, we've still got a couple of minutes just before starting. Um, I feel like we're like ships passing in the night. Now, you're just trying to avoid me. Sure. I tell oh. you, it's the strangest thing being in the office with no one here. It's just just unnerving. Ah, uh, yeah, that is, it is tough times. And we do hope that everyone that's um, tuning in at the moment in time, that you're all keeping safe and well. And, and um, oh, wow, it's, it's just a very, very difficult time for all, isn't it, really? Um, I can see that we've just had a, a, a bunch of people that have just kind of jumped onto the webinar. A big hello to everyone that's said good morning to us via, via the chat facility. Um, I apologise for repeating myself here, but just before we actually start the webinar, for those that have just joined, if you do want to pose any questions or if you do want to say hello, um, if you're on a laptop, there is a chat facility just there, or depending on your settings, it might be there. If you're using a mobile device, all you simply need to do is just scroll down, just bring it up, and you will see the chat facility there. Just simply use oh, those magic you. fingers and say a little hello. Um, I'm looking at the comments, Andy. We've got an Ulster Fry. Can someone tell me what an Ulster Fry is? I would be, I'd be quite keen. Hey, to I've never heard of it. I, I, knew, I knew there was a, I knew there was a Scottish breakfast and there was a English breakfast. I didn't realise there was an Irish breakfast as well. Well, whoever it is, it just posted that comment right. while we're killing time here. If you want to kind of let us know, we would be intrigued. And I think the next time we go to Ireland, we may have to try it out. What do you think, James? <laughs> Let's not come in before we know what it is, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that is true. That is true. Well, <laughs> Gavin, um, why does it involve Guinness? <laughs> uh, well, well, do you know that if it involves Guinness, any of our Irish friends that are over okay. there that wants to throw an invite over to PC staff, we would be more than welcome once this <laughs> COVID-19 thing passes. So feel free to invite us at andy at property-care.org. That's andy at property care property-care.org. Better not get the email address wrong for that one, eh, James? No. 
But um, without further ado, um, it's nine o'clock. I think it's time to maybe kind of pass over to our, our, our presenter, James Berry, today and his presentation, The Evolution of Damp Control. So over to yourself, James. Morning, all. Um, thank you very much for joining us. There's a, a fair few of you, which, um, which is encouraging. Um, firstly, because this isn't the first time I've done this presentation, and I noticed a few of you um, would have been there the first time I've done this. So you're obviously suckers for punishment. Uh, and also, I appreciate this one was quite short notice. So again, uh, good to see all of you here. Um, so evolution of damp control. Um, how did this come about? Well, this was originally done at the, the conference last year. Um, there's a bit added to, to today. Um, you're going to be guinea pigs as well to, to a certain degree. So we're going to try and push a poll out at one point. So please get involved in that. Um, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, so, you know, you, you seem to have figured out how to, certainly the chat facility. Um, we're going to try and get a bit of chat going on in that as well. Um, we're trying to see how much engagement we can get. So let's see how we go. But truth be told, I mean, this isn't really an evolution at all. It's sort of more origins as to sort of how we approached uh, ground control in the, in the beginnings. But um, so damp control, where do we start with damp control? It's a huge area. And when you think about it, essentially our entire building envelope has evolved around the management of water. So if you think about, you know, on the on the left hand side there, we've got, uh, if you look at the roofs, the pitch of the roofs, the roofing material, um, the way we discharge water off them, the inclusion now of rainwater goods, how those rainwater goods have, have changed. So even um, our roofs have changed. And then if we go down to the very bottom of our houses as well, the foundations have evolved to, to deal with moisture. Um, the material we use in the foundations now, you know, the, the inclusion of DPMs is standard practice. Um, so our buildings have changed in, in many ways to deal with water. Um, and then everything in between that as well, when you start looking at it, um, particularly the walls. So our walls, uh, we've gone from solid walls. So uh, the, the picture of the terrace property in the middle there is a, a solid wall construction. Um, that's from the, the Brighton area. So uh, it's quite an unusual form of solid wall construction. And, um, you know, if any, I, I won't tell you what it is just yet, but sort of a few comments, if you can get it in there as to anyone who knows what sort of construction that might be. But obviously with solid wall construction, the premise was that essentially you had wetting and drying and, and the hope that the wool would dry out before, you know, it continued and, and before dampness managed to manif manifest itself on the internal leaf. And perhaps the biggest change we had was to cavity wall construction, where you no longer had one leaf, you had an inner leaf and an outer leaf, an, an inner leaf that could get wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. Uh, and, and a void in the middle, um, and then where dampness couldn't get across, um, and then an inner leaf that permanently stayed dry, so that there was no chance of decorative spoiling in there or, or dampness on the inner leaf. But then when you start looking in more detail, if you start looking within that void as well, you can see some of the changes and more of the evolution of um, how our buildings have adapted to, to deal with water. So within the cavity as well, um, you, we've now got the inclusion of things like cavity trays to uh, deal with any water that manifests itself in them in that void. And then if you start looking at things like um, cavity wall ties, and if you look at the design of any cavity wall tie, it's designed in a way that it has a built-in drip feature in the middle. So any water that, that was to, to track across that tie will then get discharged into, into the void which then starts begging the question as to why you'd want to fill your, your void up with insulation and potentially inhibit that. But um, that's probably a, a conversation for another day, and we probably will touch on that in our, in our uh, cavity, what defects of cavity wall presentation in a few weeks' time. But that just goes to show sort of some of the changes that have happened over time. Um, and then you can start looking inside the property as well. Um, we've gone from having sort of fairly drafty houses to, to more airtight properties. 
Um, if you look at things, uh, the inclusion of UPVC double glazing have made our properties more airtight. We no longer tend to have chimneys and things like that. So we've now got to start looking at the, the management of internal atmospheric moisture as well. Um, so we've seen a, a greater dependence on mechanical ventilation. Um, and even that in itself has evolved as well. We, we've gone from relatively primitive intermittent uh, extractor fans that, that work sort of manually being turned on and off, and, and then to seeing them included with light switches to, to modern sort of continuous running fans that we get today with um, those with heat exchanger elements and, and whole house systems as well. So again, another huge topic on, on damp control that, that you know we simply couldn't cover in, in 40 minutes. So what we've had to do is, what I've done is really hone this presentation in on, on one core aspect of, of damp control. And, and that one is the one that's probably closest to most of our hearts. And that is the evolution of, of groundwater and all, how we deal with groundwater, particularly sort of capillary rise as it were. So I'm gonna throw out sort of a question now. Um, and I want you to try and uh, please comment on in the comments section as to when did DPCs become mandatory? So we now is standard practice. You won't see a modern building without one um, or, you know, for the last 120 odd years we've been using them. But when did they become man mandatory? Um, you know, please comments in there. What, what was the law that sort of set it up? 1875, and anyone that um, can beat that, 1908, a few coming in there, post-Second World War. And anyone that um, can tell me sort of the legislation they think that might have been responsible for it, Public Health Act. What year, Russell? Oh, it's coming in thick and fast, doesn't it, there, James? Yeah, That's worked better than I thought it would do, 18... Uh, Definitely. I've, I've, oh, it's, it's getting quite a variety here. What a huge spread as well. Ah. So, let's have a look. So, we've got a bit of a mixture there, haven't we? An absolutely broad one. But one date that, that seems to have come up quite a bit is the Public Health Act 1875. Now, I just want to check, is any, there was a comment there about screen freeze. Is that still, are we moved on, Andy? We. I, I think it was just with that one particular individual that may have had an internet connection. We, we'd all move. So let's start with the Public Health Act 1875. 1875. It come up a few times, and I know that those that saw me do the presentation back in uh, November would, will know the answer to this, but... The Public Health Act 1875 is often accredited to, to being the, the, the source of or the, what made damp-proof courses mandatory. Um, and, you know, you can be forgiven for, for thinking so, because if you look at BRE document, and even if you trawl the, um, the, the, BDP, the BDPA archives, the, the, there's evidence to suggest that this was the act that, that started DPC or made them mandatory anyway. However, for anyone that is um, sad enough to having trawled this document, um, I only know of two people um, that have, myself, and my predecessor, Mike Bromley, um, have spent the time. In fact, Mike Bromley even has a copy of this, a hard copy of this document. Um, that just goes to show how old he is, I think, but, but there we are. Um, no offence, Mike, you know I love you. So... If you trawl this document, you will actually see that there's no references to damp, damp-proof courses, rising damp, anything like that. But what this document does actually look at is things like unsound meat, pollution of waterways, uh, and sanitation, things like that. So when you start looking at the context, uh, the context of when this document was written, and particularly looking at the state of urban living, you know, Victorian urban living was notorious for how bad it was. Um, and you're looking at, in 1875, the life expectancy of a middle-class male was 45 years old. And then for a, a, for a workman or a labourer, it was essentially half of that. So that just goes to show the sort of poor conditions that were sort of rife at the time. So this act was essentially designed to try and combat that and, and improve sort of the, the, the filthy urban living that we had in our country. It didn't say that we had to have 
DPCs. However, what this document did do is it empowered local governments to be able to put in uh, bylaws, um, and those bylaws um, were to improve uh, housing conditions. And it is part of these bylaws that we started to see the introduction of um, the necessity for damp proof courses. Now, unfortunately, this was given to me after the presentation in November. Now, this is not the actual bylaws, and obviously they're going to be they're going to vary vary regionally. Um, so, but thank you for Duncan Phillips for providing this. Um, but what essentially is this is an essay on the bylaws or, or a model of the bylaws. So, what was recommended that should be included, and you shall see. Um, so, from seventeen, every wall of such building to have a proper damp crew, uh, damp course of sheet lead, asphalt, or slates laid in cement or other durable materials. So not only that is it gives us a bit of an indication as well as to what damp proof courses looked at like in, in 1875 as well. Um, but there were some rather more interesting and, and more ornate looking damp proof courses at the time as well. So this is one um, which um, we found in the Reba general meeting notes of 1863. So this is 10 years prior to um, to the, the, the Public Health Act. So this was written by a, a chap called John Taylor Esquire. Um, he was asked to uh, provide a, a specification for a, a church in the Isle of Dogs. And this is what he came up with. He, he went to the site before construction and noticed all the surrounding slums were absolutely rife with damp. Um, and this was, was designed to be a, a central hub for, for the local area to, to draw people from far and wide. Um, so they, this was you know, a, a building that was high, held in high regard so that they wanted to make sure that there was no damp there. And this is what he proposed to put in there. So essentially a, a, a series of ornate perforated bricks um, to increase evaporation and, and prevent the rise of moisture. Um, the other thing that he sells about this um, the stamp proof course is that it provides subfloor ventilation as well. So a secondary bonus, he, he realizes that um, if you cut off subfloor ventilation, there is the risk of, of timber decay, um, uh, particularly the dangers of dry rot. And he alludes to that in his article. Um, it's a quite an interesting one. The earliest um, patent for a damp proof course that I've been able to find is 1841. So what we can probably say, having looked at all the information and the fact that we're, we're sort of now by 1877, it's been suggested they should be included in all these buildings. By this point, it's very much best practice. And certainly by 1875, it's best practice. However, it wasn't, the, uh, it wasn't legislation until the, till the bylaws came in. This is a, another version of that sort of ornate damp proof course. Well, in fact, this is, this is St. Crispin's Hospital in, in Northamptonshire, which opened in 1876. Um, essentially, it's a, a mental asylum. Um, also a set of uh, a 1970s Doctor Who series for those that are interested in that. But as you can see, it, it, architecturally, it is quite a, a significant building. So much so, if you look at the, the extent of the measures that they were going to to try and protect it from ground or capillary rise, you've obviously got that, that perforated brick damp proof course. You then, you've got a blue brick damp proof course. And then on top of that, they've got a, a plinth damp proof course on top of that. So that goes to show sort of the extent of the levels that they were going to to try and protect this building. This was, um, and, and thank you to Jervis who sent me this book, um, recently been published as an ebook for those that, um, uh, I think last month or something like that, The Englishman's House, which was written by Charles, um, Charles Richardson in 1874. So again, similar time. And he, again, discusses this sort of perforated um, brick type of damp proof course. Um, but the one thing that he includes in this as well, well, there's two things that, that I know of significance I took from this. The one that he credits it to um, a different builder, it wasn't uh, John Taylor, but he accredits it to a, a Mr. Olden of, of Kensington. But in this, in this book, he also suggests that uh, what they do or should be doing 
is putting a, a perforated sheet of zinc in front of the, um, the, the air vent, as it were, uh, to prevent any insect ingress as well. Um, that book is quite, I've not had a chance to, to trawl it in its full extent, but um, it's quite interesting. Uh, some of the other things it talks about as well um, is, so this is in 1874, um, and it talks about the use of Portland cement as a uh, means of providing an impervious layer for, de for decorative spoiling, as it were. Another myth that I would quite keen to, to dispel as well. So again, these are similar uh, examples of this perforated damp proof course, but these aren't from uh, dear old Blighty. These are actually from the other side of the world. These are from Adelaide in Australia. Um, the case on the right is from the 1930s. Uh, it's an 1840s church, but was uh, put in in the 1930s. Um, the one on the left is um, from 1879. So again, sort of similar period. So, you know, the, there is reports that the, the rising damp is, is limited to sort of the, the shores of the UK, but obviously clearly not the case. Uh, this is a case from sort of, uh, the other side of the world um, in Adelaide, um, uh, you know, 150 years ago, essentially, where they're looking at retrofitting you know, damp proof measures. And just some of the um, the other methods of, of damp proofing that, that we're, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the ones that we see all the time. Um, you've got sort of at the top there, you've got a plinth DPC, we've got blue bricks and, and we've got slate. Um, but moving on, so... They're the types that are out there, but perhaps onto another big question, and, and hopefully we're going to throw a poll out to you now. Do DPCs fail? And again, it'll be, you know, uh, hopefully the poll's on its way to you. I'd like to see your salts. Do you think, you know, we, we've got all these forms of damp proofing uh, from sort of early damp proof courses, but what's your opinion, folks? Do you think these fail or, or not? Are, are they, if there's a damp proof course there, it's not going to fail. Well, folks, just to let you know, the poll should be with you just at the moment. If you're in a mobile device, just scroll down a little bit. Uh, if you're a laptop or desktop, it should be right in front of your screen. James, hopefully you can see the results coming through. Okay, okay. Yeah. Quite a mix, actually. Mm. Not really. There is certainly a, a clear winner. Well, guys, we'll just give this just another 10 seconds or so. So for those of you who have not done it yet, uh, just another two, three seconds. Oh, starting to swing the other way. Oh, very interesting it is as well. I went from quite a dramatic. Uh, it's not, it's a little bit unfair, isn't it? We've seen all these results and everyone else can. But oh, well, well, it's building the suspense, Andy. Let, let, let's, can you publish that? Do you want to get that up? No, I'll get, let me publish it the next There we go. Hopefully, hopefully, folks should be able to see the results on your screen. Um, just in case, James, if you just want to read out what the results are, just in case something. Yeah, for those that can't see it, essentially from the poll, um, seventy-five percent of you have said yes, damp-proof courses fail, um, and twenty-five of you have said damp-proof courses don't. Um, but what's the guidance out there? I think that's quite an interesting result, actually. Um, I thought it might have gone the other way a bit more, but um, there we are. So do DPCs fail? So what's the BRE guidance? Now, um, this is, if anyone hasn't read this book, Understanding Dampness by BRE, it's, I think it's 2004 it was produced, but it's a cracking book. If, if you haven't read it in, and you're involved in sort of dampness, I would strongly reckon it's a great one for your library. Um, there's some great stuff on gravimetrics and stuff in there. It is a few years old, but it's a, it's a brilliant book. But their guidance in there is, do DPCs fail? If there is a, a physical DPC, it is unlikely to have failed. What it does suggest is that if, you, if there's a physical DPC, then the chances are that it's more likely to have been compromised. And this is through the usual methods. So whether it be by ground levels, through... Uh, blaster, anything like that. And I'm sure, you know, we're, we're all familiar with this diagram here. This is from BRE245, um, a bit more recent, but I, I, I quite like this schematic. I think it gives a good illustration of, of the different ways that a, dam a damp proof course can be compromised. So on your left, you, you've obviously got your solid walls there. And then on your right, you, you've got your, your cavity wall. For my mind, 
if you know you've got dampness in the base of the cavity wall you should always be inspecting inside the cavity the one thing that i would arguably dispute on on this diagram is the bridging by mortar pointing i i just personally i don't see how you get the, the volume of water past it to to allow um you know to to manifest in a problem as it were so i'm a bit dubious about that one but um that's what they're saying um but they say it's unlikely to but it says physical dpcs can fail occasionally particularly those formed by engineering bricks or overlapping slates or bitumen felt dpcs can become brittle with age now i did have a question fired at me prior to the event on on bitumen felt uh, dpcs uh, essentially about the mechanics on on how the, the failure can happen um that, to be honest, I don't know exactly, um, but what the BRE is suggesting is it is due to how they become brittle. So. But what I find more interesting, having looked through literature at the time, is that, um, that it questions the quality of work at the time. And, and this is from that same Reba papers that we were talking about earlier. And it says in sort of 1862, um, how often was it seen that despite the best of intentions or, or these measures being put in place, how often was it found that the lead was stolen, the slates had been previously used in, in other applications and had been compromised, or that uh, simply the clerk of works had gone down the pub on a Friday afternoon and they thought we can get away with not putting it in, or, or the quality of work lapsed. And the other thing I think that we often forget is a lot of these houses, particularly around this sort of time when there was a huge explosion in population and, and there was a massive uh, drive to, to populate these houses, there was a lot of houses put up for the very poor very quickly. And often quality was compromised. Um, so I don't think that we should often always think that the quality of work was, you know, was faultless because it simply wasn't. So we've established that there is a degree of failure. So, but what about retrofitting DPCs and, and sort of the, the heritage of our industry, as it were? When, when does our, the, the damp remediation industry sort of have started? Now, I saw this quote on a website and I found it quite interesting. It's probably not the website you're all thinking. It was, it was actually um, someone that had applied for membership. So who says we're not a broad church nowadays, but rising damp was invented by the chemical industry in a particular chemical industry boardroom in 1962, when the first damp meter was invented. I think we can, you know, safely say that based on the information we've already looked at, that, you know, groundwater was already being looked at, considered well before this date. But, you know, this is, the, when they talk about damp meters now, that is uh, on the left there is a Marconi damp meter. Um, they stopped trading in 98, but the earliest example of a Marconi timber moisture meter that I've been able to find, because there was variants for the grain as well, um, is from 1949. So quite a bit before the 1962. But um, imagine having to carry that thing around on a survey with you. It's quite something, isn't it? I think Mike, Mike Bromley still even got his original one of those as well, which I'm sure he'll share with us one day. Um, but, um, but there we are, yeah, absolutely. So that's a, an original um, moisture, well, a, an early moisture meter, not the sort of thing you, you know, you'd want a wheelbarrow to carry that around on site with you. But what about chemical DPCs then? So perhaps this is where this statement originated from. And... English heritage suggests that um, the first chemical damp proof courses come from quite an unusual source. And they suggest that it was actually a, a chap, a Dr. Hurst of Imperial College London, who set up a company, Ta uh, Cambridge Timber Proofing Laboratories. And they patented a system called Actaid. Now, that I say it's an unusual source. And the reason it was an unusual source is because um, Dr. Hurst was actually an entomologist, so hence the beetle. There is a reason that he's there. And um, the the product that he developed, Actane, was based on the uh, the natural latex rubber and and the water repellency of, of insects or beetle shells. And this system um, was sort of developed sort of in the 1940s, 1950s, 
And, and it was installed by a series of 10 mil holes drilled at 50 mil centers. And what they would do is they would drill all the way through the, the thickness of the wall. Um, and then they would plug the internal side with a, a cement product containing the actane as well. Then Ren rig up a, a sort of essentially a guttering system externally. And then, then they'd pour the, the actane into the, the, into the holes which would then obviously be, then be plugged. Um, so that's who they're crediting. But having when I did my research and looking through various books, um, I come across a, an earlier example of a, of a chemical damp proof course. And this is going to be a name that, that's a, lo a lot more familiar to, to most of you, particularly those in the industry. So Stanley Richardson and his, and his mucker, Mr. Starling. Um, so they claim to have developed a, a water repellent in 1935. Uh, which they developed using a paraffin wax, um, which uh, the, the carrier was essentially a petroleum spirit. Now, that was adopted or adapted in, in 1938 to provide a, 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 a DPC, so, so it could be drilled and injected into walls. There was two huge problems with this, um, well, three arguably big problems with this form of damp proof course. So um, firstly, it, it predates the 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 suggestions by English Heritage that it was in the 1940s. We've got evidence that, um, you know, there was DPCs in the 1930s. But the problem with this one, based on the fact it was using the paraffin wax, um, that it wouldn't work if the temperature was too too cold or, or the walls were too damp. It also left a, a bit of a sheen on the walls when it was installed. And also it was extremely flammable as well. So, um, you know, that one didn't tend to last too long, but it goes to show that they were trying to facilitate a demand for procuring damp houses as well. Another method that, that came out around a similar time is uh, new tonight laugh, and I'm sure many of you have seen this and, and come across this on your travels. Now, this was brought back, um, it was bought, the patent was brought by um, a John Newton at a German trade fair in 1937. Now, on the eve of all war, when you know all, all foreigners were, were kicked out of Germany, he, he left and, and brought the product back to the UK. It was originally developed for external use, um, but when he brought it back to Blighty, due to you know our narrow streets or and you know our, our urban areas, it was designed to to then use as an internal product. Obviously, different approach. You know, not trying to actually stop capillary rides but more trying to mask it but again it shows sort of in in the 1930s this sort of demand for, for trying to cure um dampness in, in our housing stock and, and sort of this is a, a remedial measure as well um however another remedial measure for, for curing damp and, and a slightly earlier one is the, the nap and tube now developed in in 1908 by um Achilles Knappen, who was a, a, an engineer from Brussels. The license for this product was bought, the UK license was bought in 1928. Now, the original Knappen product is the, the triangular shaped product that you can see in, in the, the inset window there. Obviously, uh, uh, on the, the main picture is, is the Dalton product. And they obviously work on the premise that, that they increase evaporation. So, in the 1930s, the, the building research station, which is now BRE, suggested that these products didn't work. Um, but that didn't mean that they, they weren't vastly popular. You know, I, I'm sure all of you that are surveying buildings have come across them. And, and again, they were used across the continent as well. There, there's power. So this is um, a church in, in Bari. Um, in, no, sorry, in Alicante. The church is the Con Cathedral Sim. Sim uh, in Alicante, I can't even pronounce that. I'd, how ignorant do I look? But um, but there we are. But what you see, obviously, quite a historical building. We think this was uh, retrofitted in the 1950s. Um, but this was a, a product which was originally sort of developed, as I say, in, in Brussels, but sort of widely used on the continent, as it were. But we're also seeing modern equivalents of this as well. So despite the fact, you know, Almost 100 years ago, tests bit proving that this system didn't work, we're still seeing modern variants of this, this product still being sold. 
One of the other big concerns about this product as well um, that the historic England identify is the, the potential risk for in, in, ingress for insects and, and rodent control, that sort of thing. And I think probably one of the main object, modern object or current objection to the, this sort of system is the selling practices as well. Um, often sold that sort of no internal works are required. Um, and we all know that essentially, if you've got a, a true case of rising damp, you're going to have contamination to the plaster work. And when you've got salt contamination to the plaster work, unless you do something with that, that salt, you, there's always going to be a visible damp problem there. So the, how did the, this work without internal works, if, if it is meant to solve type rising damp, is questionable. However, perhaps one of the earliest references to a, a remedial action for, for damp proofing, um, and I promise that this is the, the dullest slide and I'll make it a bit easier for you. This is from the, the, uh, the, the Wyatt Hapworth Glint Encyclopedia of Architecture from 1894, which is available online, but that's the bit we're looking for. Um, so he's talking about protection from, from groundwater and he says, the radical remedy would be to cut out the wall below the ground floor level and insert a physical damp proof course. So prior to, to the, the easier measures that we, we've obviously formulated and developed today, what they were talking about was inserting a, a suitable physical damp proof course. Now we all know that, you know, that's not necessarily easy, it's expensive, um, and obviously there's an inherent risk with that. And this article identifies that and says, otherwise you simply got to put up with it which most people wouldn't do today. However, what did the Romans do for us? So this is people's front of Judea. So, I mean, if anyone can name these for or even remember for, for me. So we've got aqueducts, sanitation, roads, irrigation, medicine, education, and damp proofing. Were these the forefathers of the damp proofing industry? Now, this chap here was a bit of a genius, to say the least. Uh, and he was Marcus Vitruvius Polio, or more commonly known as Vitruvius, uh, from the first century BC. He was a Roman, and he was the inspiration, or he was for the master from the Lego movies, the master builder, uh, who is also called Vitruvius. Um, and then you've got Vitruvian Man in the top right-hand corner there from Leonardo da Vinci, which was inspired by the notes of Vitruvius. So this is one of the guys that inspired Leonardo da Vinci. This is sort of the, the, the caliber of the man. He was a, an army general as well, um, but he was also more famous for writing his 10 books of architecture. And within those books, he, he talks about, he, he recognizes the problem of groundwater and, and the inherent risk that that poses. And what he suggests within those books are that for the first three foot of wall that, that a burnt brick should be added to the, the, the mortar mix, as it were, to make it more cement-like and essentially make it more resistant to the passage of water. So isn't that 2,000 years ago that, you know, that perhaps our in industry originally began? Hopefully what we've looked at or I've demonstrated is, is that our approach to, to moisture in buildings has certainly changed a lot over the course of essentially 2,000 years. But it's always been, been a problem. But we've had to change, but we still need to embrace change because change is coming um, and it's going to be coming more and more. And if there's any saving grace, I think for... For the coronavirus, I mean, it has probably put a stop to <laughs> Extinction Rebellion and, and, and their protest for a while and the inconvenience they cause. And, but despite what people's views are, I think most people agree that Extinction Rebellion probably have a just cause for a, a, a lobbying for the right thing, even if their, their actions are not necessarily the, the, the best way of going about it. And what that means is we need to change our housing stocking in huge ways. So we're looking at things sort of particularly retrofit insulation. And we, we you know, we'll be looking at some of the, the implications of that when it's not done rightly and the effects it can cause with dampness. 
we touched on earlier about sort of we're making our buildings more airtight as well. And this is placing greater and greater emphasis on, on the need for mechanical ventilation as well. So this is more forms of dampness that we need to be looking at and need to be considering as well. The other things we need to be looking at um, is the people that occupy these buildings as well. Um, I'm going to give millennials a bit of a kick in, and I think I can get away with it because I am one. But the vast majority of millennials, you know, dare I say, it, don't know the right end of the hammer to use. Um, I consider myself fairly lucky and pretty hands-on sort of person, but the vast majority of millennials aren't. Um, and that is probably, you know, people aren't going to trades like they were, you know, generations past. They don't know how to maintain buildings. They don't know how to look after buildings. And this is how we prevent a lot of the damp issues. So is this going to change the way that, that we look at dampness and, and how we approach dampness? Is it going to lead to more of a, a proactive approach to dampness rather than a reactive approach to dampness? Does it need to look for, for more maintenance plans and, and, and sort of is there scope for changing there as well? So change is coming. Um, we're also seeing that in, in the way we're going about our, our diagnostics of dampness as well. Uh, problems are becoming more complex as a result of these changes we're making. Um, We've seen the, the launch of the methodology, which is available on, online. Um, a lot of work sort of that Steve has done with Historic England. And that just sort of goes to show that the, the sort of coming together and the, the standards that are expected because damp problems are becoming more and more complex. So I'd just like to say a few thank yous. Um, so there was a huge amount of work that's had to go into this and, and pulling information from all manner of sources as well. So I, I have had a lot of help with this. So I'd, I'd like to thank um, Mr. Coleman, uh, Jervis as well, Mr. Bromley, uh, Mr. Donathorn, and Mr. Fitzsimons. Um, but there's a few others that I haven't sort of gone to the extent of embarrassing on a picture like that. So um, thanks to Hudson as well, uh, Stuart Tansey and, and Paula. Um, so thank you all. And um, a big thank you to for listening. And yeah, let's throw it open to any questions. Uh, hello, James. Firstly, many thanks for that. Um, hopefully everyone agrees with me. Very informative. And you know, it's great um, finding out a little bit more about the history of our industry, how it's all came about, and also just really kind of quizzing us in terms of, well, when do you actually think DPCs actually came about? Now, in terms of kind of questions, we are a little bit late on the questions. I just don't think anyone loves you, James. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you just... Yeah, so guys, if you don't love James, feel free to comment, but not, guys, I'm only joking, they're being flippant. Um, but guys, please do, um, if you do have any kind of questions now. Yeah, there, there's a question here, that Steve Edwards one. Um, yeah, and I think someone's even answered it um, with regards to, um, there was a, a study uh, on the efficiency of the, the Dutch damp proofing system. And, and Graham has written a, a cracking bit on that, which is available on his website. If not, I know it's certainly on the Complete Preservation website, so you can get it there. Um, which you know pretty much dispels the, the the myth of the that they're working as it were so let's have a look is there any more questions well there is there has been a quite a debate going back and forth from our very own steve hodgson um, adrian dawson and others and it's all about vocs uh, and it, and um, its impact on damp proof courses i mean just throwing it out to yourself james just so you can add to this debate i mean what, what, what Hang on, on what, sorry, and, and damp proof courses? Um, volatile organic compounds and its impact in deteriorating damp proof courses. Do you feel it does deteriorate damp proof courses or do you feel it's a load of baloney? It depends on the, on the type, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I, there's a lot of me mechan mechanisms that can deteriorate damp proof courses, you know, and over time that you know natural products are, are going to deteriorate naturally so yeah that's um yeah and there's a, a few that have sort of said um what there's a, a few methods that i've missed off you know I, and, and that was semi-intentional as well um i could have looked at uh, electric osmosis i could have looked at sort of solvents and emulsion based products and, and things like that and and all the way to, to modern fixotropic creams now, 
the having looked at the audience and most of these are, that are there, you know, most of you were installing these products and, and there, there was the, almost little merit in me sort of telling you stuff that you, you probably know better than I do. Um, so there's no point in me covering these things because most of the, the audience knows that. Um, now I know not everyone will do, um, but I, the reason I chose not to do that is let's let's sort of look at the stuff that that's a bit unusual that that didn't sort of cover the, the bit that people are aware of and, and that people know. So that's sort of the reason we, we could go into electric osmosis and, you know, the, the dark ass that it is that we could look at injection mortars as well. But again, these are more recent modern developments. And, and you know, again, where do you draw the line? You know, we could go on for hours if we start looking at things like fixed tropic creams and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, we've. Well, I mean, one uh, Mike um, Kidder here has uh, made the comment that one of the things he sees a lot is chemical damp proof courses installed well above the line of the original bitumen. Um, why is this? And interestingly enough, do you know, just off the back of your comment there, Mike, um, I did actually receive an email as well from Tony at Dampworks that very much actually said the exact same thing. I mean, why do you think people actually do this? Well, you know, I would like just to hope that, particularly modern damp proof courses that are, you know, and part of my accessibility of modern products are available to all. Um, and that's, you know, we can do all the training, we can push everything, but these products are readily available to people that aren't necessarily qual qualified to, to install them um, and do the interpretation. So unfortunately, and, and Steve alluded to it at the conference as well, that there is bad work being done by people that don't understand what they are should be doing. And it gives the people that do know what they're doing a, a bad name, unfortunately. Um, but we know um, on, on the flip side that Staffordshire Blue Brick uh, Damp Proof courses are prone to failure they are one of the ones that that can fail um same with bitumen felt they're the ones that have been tested by bre and are the ones that that they say you know there is a likelihood to fail they say again they don't say it's that common but they say that they that it can happen so as long as the correct diagnostics have been done then okay well, i'm just kind of scanning through here um i i, I can see that there's still this debate over vocs and DP. <laughs> Uh, you know, going on, um, Mike's just actually come back just now. I, oh no, it's not actually a question. He's just mentioned about how the industry's moved on in the last 15, 20 years. Mike, um, I would very much agree with you there. I know, um, James, you're more longer in the tooth here on this and certainly more technical on this one. I think it's a far cry from where we were 20 years ago. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, without wanting to smut blows smoke up someone up my boss's ass but you know i think he's done a huge amount and, and credit to him for for the work he's done on that particularly and on raising standards within the industry but um you know i don't want him blushing or anything like that or you know my god I <laughs> I, you know I, I think that's common consensus as well and, yes, yes. You know, everyone within the pca has, has has done huge amounts of work to, to improve that so well, okay. Well, I think that is us for questions, unless James, you've spotted something. That Let's I've... have a look. Yes, I was just trying to get this. Yes. There's a fair bit of chat going on here. Uh, there is, and guys, this is great. This is exactly what we wanted. We want you engaging with us. We want you chatting to us. If you have an opinion and you disagree with us, God forbid, uh, we are keen to actually hear your thoughts. We're keen to kind of chat about it. We're keen to discuss it. So, I mean, we are, we are loving all this engagement that's coming through. Um, I think just looking at time here, James, I think we're probably, um, there's not, I can't see any other questions coming through just at the moment in time. I think, so, um, oh, have you spotted something? No, well, I'm trying to get it so I can see the view where I can just see the questions, but that's... Um... Yeah, that, I think I think we're I think we're good for for quiz. But guys, if you do have any other questions, um, and we have actually missed it, we will actually take a wee look through the stream, and we will ensure that we do get back to you via email with a kind of answer. Um, just kind of moving on, just for folks that are looking for a little bit additional information. Some of you will be aware of this, but you can visit our damp control library. Uh, the email address is there. It's just that. Uh, 
where the, the property-care.org forward slash stamp control library, where you'll see a variety of um, codes of practices and guidance notes within there. But also on top of that as well, we will be doing a replay of this particular webinar, which should be available at some point early next week, probably on the Tuesday or the Wednesday when we actually come back. So feel free to share that with any of your colleagues or anyone that you think it might be of interest to. Um, just to kind of let you know just what's actually coming up, we've got a couple of things coming up, starting off with this afternoon. So if you haven't registered for this, I would strongly encourage you to the PCA pub quiz. Now, this was just a little bit of light hearted fun just to break the the monotony of the depressing news that we've been having in terms of COVID-19. Um, it's been hosted by our very own pub master, Steve Hodgson, at 2 p.m. this afternoon. If you want to register for it, I would strongly encourage you to kind of go along. Just simply go to our webinar page, which is just simply www.property-care.org forward slash webinars. That's www.property-care.org forward slash webinars. But we do have some other stuff coming up starting off next week. Um, we've got, again, our Tune In Tuesday, our first one there on Tuesday, very successful. Big thanks for everyone that came on and big thanks for all the questions and the debating that kind of went on there. We do have another special guest on that particular day that's going to help us in terms of kind of credit control and what you can actually do and how you can actually help your customers. Um, we also have another two webinars as well later on that week. On the Thursday, we've got our Wood Decay and Buildings Causes and Cures being hosted by our own Dr. Peter Fitzsimmons. And the following week, as you uh, heard James uh, refer to earlier on in the presentation, we have our Defects in Cavity Wall Construction, which again has been hosted by our very own and truly James Berry. Big smile, James, there. Oh, there we go. There we go. But again, guys, if you want to register for any of these, and again, I really encourage everyone to try and maybe come along for this pub quiz this afternoon, especially just with it being before Easter, just simply go to www.property-care.org forward slash webinars. Um, yeah, that, that reminds me. I never said what that construction type was uh, right at the beginning because someone's mentioned Bungaroosh in the comments. Um, sorry to, to interject, but yes, Bungaroosh was the solid construction type at the beginning there, which is essentially lime and any other stuff they can find filling around. And I believe it's normally cast in concrete uh, railway sleepers. Um, but yeah, sorry, completely forgotten. Um, that's quite good for uh, considering I'm a non techie. I just I was assuming people were drunk in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, folks, again, um, firstly, big thank you to you, James, for the presentation and kind of going through it. Um, again, very informative. I hope everyone agrees. Um, big thank you to you guys, our listeners. Um, it's, it's, we wouldn't be able to do this without you. I've just. Um, <laughs> I, I might have just yeah okay no no actually that gives people an insight steve no no nothing don't worry oh oh right oh is steve posting something in the chat yeah. oh, okay steve, you're about late. you should have gone back to us a wee bit earlier here but anyway guys just to finish off a big thank you for listening and tuning in um hopefully you enjoyed the webinar today we hopefully look forward to seeing you in future webinars and uh, last but not least, please, please do keep safe, take care of yourselves and your family, and hopefully we catch you either this afternoon or at some point next week. But guys, take care and bye from us. <laughs>